Welcome to a new edition of the 77%, the show for Africa's youth. I'm your host, Liz Cho. On this week's show, we'll focus on how women often have to go to great lengths in order to find work. We'll meet young Ugandan entrepreneurs who decided to take matters into their hands and create their own jobs. We get to know Karen, Kenya's rising R&B star who chose Nairobi over Boston for her career. And together with you, we are fighting gender-based violence. You sent us your videos dancing to the song Chooser produced by Namibia's Ease and the 77%. Now, the stage is yours. Work hard in school so that you get a good job. That's what many of our parents told us when we were little. But finding work is tough for many young Africans. In South Africa, youth unemployment rates are staggering. Also in Cape Town, Namhla is one of those desperately looking for a job, but she knows that sitting around feeling sorry for herself won't help. So she's taking steps that she hopes will bring her closer to the launch of her career. When Namhla and her friends go walking in Cape Town's high street, browsing and not buying is currently the only option. The 25-year-old South African is unemployed and money is tight. It's frustrating because uh, there are a lot of things that I want for myself that I can't afford for myself and also for my child as well. So it's a bit frustrating and um, uh, it's a... Um, it's distracting as a whole. Namhla had studied psychology, but couldn't afford her student fees anymore and had to stop. But she knows that even her classmates who graduated had difficulties finding a job. You have to have connections. Um, people employ their own, they get uh, their own cousins, their own sisters uh, to get jobs in their own working places. So it's hard for you, as an unknown, to, to get a job. In addition to that, many women face the expectation of having to offer sex to get the job. If you want to have a job, you have to sleep with someone. And it's not easy for some of us. I am married, so I can't do that. And I can't sleep with whoever I don't have feelings for. So I would rather stay home and wait for my husband's salary while I'm still trying to get other forms of job. In South Africa, every second person under 34 is currently unemployed. Women of color are especially vulnerable. An economy in recession is one of the reasons for the job crisis, but not the only one, knows Tami Chetty. She is Chief Operating Officer of the youth employment NGO Harambe. The education system fails young people. Young people are saying that they don't know how to go and look for a job. So they don't have the networks, they don't have the finances, and they don't have the quality education, and they don't know what they'll be good at anyway. So they, they don't know where to start. Namhla decided to tackle the challenge step by step. Through a Facebook post, she learned about Harambe and applied for a course. The NGO partners with companies to help young job seekers find employment. In the course, Namhla and her teammates learn about job essentials. They teach us how to make our own CVs and how to uh, do things with a team because they know that, okay, you've been unemployed for a long time and then you don't really know how to tackle the challenges between working with a team because you're all, all about yourself. After a seven-week program, she is equipped with new skills and self-esteem. I'm glad that other people can actually see that I am a positive person and I am a resilient person. It shows that um, what I like to say, I also put in action. Since the end of the program, Namhla found a temporary job as a teaching assistant, a big step in achieving her dream of getting permanent work. 
So, there are two approaches to finding work. Some, like Nam Kla, choose to apply for jobs. Others decide to create their dream jobs themselves. In our street debate, Josephine Karunji talked to young entrepreneurs in the Ugandan capital Kampala, and they discussed the thrill and the pitfalls of starting your own business. Hello and welcome to the 77% Street Debate. My name is Josephine Karunji and we are in Kampala today with a young team of uh, entrepreneurs. They're going to be speaking to us about the challenges but also giving solutions uh, that young people can pick from as they get into entrepreneurship. So we're going to quickly start and I'm going to start with Tori. Tori who is a young person, you just graduated and why aren't you looking for formal employment? I have been looking for a job since I started university. Surprising, I've been looking for a job because I was like, I don't want to get out of university and then I don't have a job. But then when you're applying for jobs, everything, you're only going to find people asking for experience. Five years experience, six years experience, three years experience. I mean, like, I haven't started working yet, so how am I going to have that experience? And besides that, I think I can only gain the experience when I'm given an opportunity to work. Also, the good thing about it is next to you are two people who have been in this field for a long time. But I'm curious before I move on to them, what do you think it's going to be like? Do you have a plan and do you think it's going to be an easy journey? I love cooking a lot. I love good food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and besides being a dancer, it gives me that energy. So food, we use food <laughs> when we are dancing. So I love cooking and I've always wanted to have a restaurant of my own. But then also to start a restaurant, I need capital. And then also to have that capital, that means I have to have something I'm doing in order to get that capital. All right. So, Sandra, you've been in business for a couple of years now. I'm curious to know what your start was like. Was it easy? After my first degree, just like her, I was looking for a job and I'd failed to find one. So at that point of time, I learned a skill and that skill was how to make soap. I started making the soap during the night and during the day I would look out for clients to buy from me the soap. All right. So I'm going to go to Ricky, who is uh, a bit of a celebrity. What was it like for you at the start? I was in the border border industry as a motorcycle taxi rider and grew from being a motorcycle taxi rider to being a tour guide and lost a friend in a border related accident and started off as an advocate of road safety where I was just promoting helmet wearing. And that's how the, the idea was built to now what we, we know today as Safe Border, which has grown to become the number one ride ailing app for motorcycle taxis um, in Africa. Um, I think we, we like them. We like them because they're fast, they get us in place in time, but then it's the safety issues. Maren, you're in one of the businesses that's, that's quite scary for a lot of people. You're into money lending. Tell me about the worst thing that's happened to you in that business. The worst situation that has ever happened to me was when Corona came in. You have lent out money to people and you're seeing the situation that people are not earning, they are not working, they are not doing anything. And then you have to recover your capital back, you want the profit, but you cannot receive it. Because at the moment there is no way you can tell someone I want my money when they are not working actually. All right. Other challenges, people? Most policies don't favor young people. You find a policy like if you go to the bank, you have to have collateral, and they're lending you at about 30%, above 25%. That's very expensive for a young person who is venturing into a business which you're starting, you know? Ricky, I'm curious about the challenges you faced along the way. You will hear some of these stories one day of businesses that has been killed because of taxation. And, and, and to, the, to, to be honest with you, we really believe that taxation is great for this country, but we don't want taxation to really be like a tool that okay. can be used by certain units in government to kill businesses. Thank you very much, Ricky. Uh, Sandra, I'm curious about, you know, listening to what Ricky is saying, does this also speak to the investment climate? Do you think that our climate here encourages investments? The environment here does not favor investment. If you're going to go and borrow money, you're borrowing at about 18%, 25% per annum. Or if you go to a money lender, you're going to get that money at 10%, 15% per month. That's very high. She says 30%. 30%, yes, that's very high for investment. Because you see, 
me, I'm a social entrepreneur too. I invest with mostly impact, looking at impact more. So when you give me this money, it's expensive. I'm not going to make returns there and then. I may make returns maybe after a year. So that's what makes the investment here very expensive. So we need more alternatives. Tori, I'm curious about, you know, one of the issues you raised was lack of capital. And I, I know that there are a lot of government programs for young people. So the youth livelihood program and so on. Are these things you've thought about? Have you tried and failed? Is it just not working? What is it? I haven't really tried out, but then I've had it from friends. I've had friends say the government programs that help, but then also I don't know how to approach these people. How do we approach them? What is needed? Where do you start from? And we're not really sensitized about these things when we are in school or about to leave school and stuff like that. Ricky, you laughed when we mentioned this. So um, um, when we spoke about government funding, you were laughing. And I'm curious, had you tried this before? Uh, have you had stories? What is it about it? So, so Josephine, I'm actually laughing because I kind of see you as an agent or a promoter. <laughs> you have what we call foreign investors. And these foreign investors are mostly from two, two countries. India, to be specific, China. and China. These people have got huge investment. And you, you hear of stories here that an investor is going to build a hospital and government is going to fund the investor to build the hospital. And these are things that really, really hurt us. And the reason this is happening is because they are able to really give money to a few other people who are able to convince government. We won't tell government that we are Ugandans. We love our country so much. Close to 40% of young people, unemployed, unemployed. The people making this show, they're like, what, 15, 20% of the total population of Uganda. Let's get real about these issues that affect us. When you us. speak about in in inclusion for the young people, and I think one of the key things that um, I hear you sort of hint at is the people who are making decisions for youth as youth should actually be youth. People who are making decisions for us don't know us. One of the things we constantly hear is capital to start a business. It's one of the things that Tori mentioned. And I'm curious uh, to, to the ladies on this side, what are your solutions to Tori's problem? So start from where you are. Start with what you have. 80% is behavior. You have to learn the disciplines. You have to keep on improving yourself. I, I say I invest in a book every, every month. I read a book. I listen to different people speaking, mentoring me. I had to learn how to employ people. I had to learn how to hire. I had to learn how to fire. Yeah. So I so much believe for most businesses, uh, that's the most key. So we have solutions, but we also have challenges. And I think it's up to everybody out there to you know pick whether they're going to take them up and utilize them. But I think there have been really great solutions from people who have started from nothing to get to where they, they all are. Uh, so that's it for the 77% here in Kampala. Thank you for joining us. And that's it. Thanks a lot to everyone involved in this debate. And you can check out a longer version of the debate on YouTube. Well, making a career sometimes comes with the wish to go abroad. And this is exactly what singer Karen from Kenya did. But when she was in the United States, she realized that the best place to make it is actually her hometown, Nairobi. So she's back on the continent. My name is Karen, and some people pronounce it Karun. I'm a musician. I sing, I produce, I songwrite, I play some instruments here and there. I just got back from Berklee College of Music a couple of years ago. That was in Boston, and I decided to come back and live in Nairobi. Music has always been a part of my life. So apparently since the age of four, I've known that I wanted to be a singer. And so I just pursued things that would keep me in line with that. Um, taking music lessons, performing at every chance I got in school, volunteering to make the performance track for like the dance team in school. I just always found myself doing something musical. When I heard that three in five kids wants to leave the country, I'm not surprised. Like conversations that I have with my friends, everybody's always like, yeah, but you can't do it in Kenya, so you know what I mean, I'm just working to get out of here. Like even me, that's also <laughs> what I'm doing. I, I, I work with, without the Kenyan limitations in mind, and so I hope to travel. And so when I did get to leave the country, 
for the first time, I'd never been to the States, I'd never lived abroad. That was, I mean, it was cool, but I was also somewhat disappointed. If you're one of those youth that really want to leave the country, I would say do it. Like, go travel, go see the world, go acquire as much information as you can. And so leaving isn't always a bad thing. It's just like, don't leave and then don't come back. It's like we still need, we still need young, great minds in Kenya. My purpose is to break boundaries using music. And I think that's something that we did back in Kamula and something we didn't really set out to do, we just did it naturally. I think that was all of our purposes at the time. And I, I feel like I just have to continue doing what I do just to show others that it's possible. Be it just making pop music, making alternative music, being a female, an African, making music that can transcend boundaries, transcend borders. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of doubt, self-doubt in Kenya um, and a lot of suppressed artistic expression. And so I feel like I just need to pop that bubble and just allow other people to just to do you. It's not that we don't have talent. It's just that talented people don't see that their art can be useful. I'm already super passionate about supporting other artists and I mean, I got into this industry by being supported by other artists in the first place. I had people like Octo Pizzo who would give me advice. He'd always be, have my back. Blinky Bill would always have my back. Bodhani the drummer queen, and they still do. So mentors and mentoring people is really important. I've opened my mind up so much. I've met so many different kinds of people. And then it just makes me realize that we actually have a lot here in Kenya and people are really talented, people are really cool, people are stylish, we have a lot to offer. And so just seeing that juxtaposition of like being in the States, everyone talks about the States as so much opportunity. And I really think that the opportunities are in Africa right now. There's so much possibility and our perspective hasn't really been considered. We haven't really explored what we can do. I just love what Karen said about the fact that there are lots of opportunities in Africa. I mean, these days it's common to see women in managerial positions or working in sectors that used to be male-dominated. For example, IT or engineering. But what we often don't hear about is how many women are being forced to have sex with men in power in order for them to get a job. We asked women in Lagos, Nigeria, how common it is for men to ask for sexual acts during job interviews. It's a common thing for the female. And uh, I had a story, okay, friend, it's somebody so close to me, you know. She went for job outing and she got to the place. The man told her that before he can give her the job, she has to, you know, do some certain things, you know, like go to bed with him and blah, 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 blah. And she told me it has been like that. That's the way the man does for all the female staff working with him there. The manager or whoever that is in position to employ them, we say, you want to go out with them before they can secure that job. So it really happens. In this country that we are, if you must get something, people do say if you must get something, you use what you have to get what you want. So uh, for like those people in charge, they will want to ask you to sleep with them, one or two things before they can offer you the job. And you that really need the job, you will have to do what they ask you to do. Those testimonies are just shocking. And the sad fact is that this is not just happening in Nigeria. On Facebook, we asked you whether it is common for women in your region to be coerced into having sex for jobs. And here's what you wrote. 
Sporo Trustina says in Namibia, it's a culture. Thomas Wanume says here in Uganda, it's even worse. And honestly, it's the only option for our dear sisters. And finally, Gola Claude says it's a pitiful situation. In Cameroon, it's everywhere, from churches to schools and even companies. Well, the Nigerian woman in our next report is fighting against this. Aishatu Kabu Damboa wants to protect women from sexual violence and she offers job opportunities to those who need them the most. The women in a refugee camp in Maiduguri in northeastern Nigeria, one of the cities most affected by the Boko Haram insurgency. Aisha to Kabu Damboa is on her way to visit women living at the internally displaced people's camp in Maiduguri, the capital of Nigeria's northeastern Bono state. She is a gender equality activist and holds